All right. Well, I want to welcome everybody to another edition of Alaska Wildlife Alliance's Wildlife Wednesday. We are super excited for our presentation tonight um, by Kim Ram Suryan. Um, but first, my name is Mandy. I'm with Alaska Wildlife Alliance. I'm the Deputy Director and Marine Program Officer. And I just want to give you just a little bit of rules of the game tonight. So uh, real quick, we are hopefully all familiar by now with the term Zoom bombing. Uh, that's where there's an unwanted image or uh, audio in the background. So you'll notice you've been joined with your microphone and your video disabled. And we ask that you keep it that way. Um, that will not only prevent any unintended consequences, but also uh, it'll help preserve bandwidth. We are in Alaska and not all of us have the greatest um, internet connections. And so this helps us stream uh, the, and see the speaker and hear the speaker as best as we can. Uh, to help you view this presentation a little bit easier, we do suggest that you view it in full screen mode and you can look for that little picture frame shape that should help you toggle through the different views if you're not in full screen mode. Um, because we are trying to uh, preserve the bandwidth, we do urge everyone to use the chat feature um, to type your questions. You, you can feel free to type your questions into the speaker at any time during the presentation, but we will address them at the end of the presentation. But um, that way you can write them down as you think about them and we'll get to as many as we can at the end of the talk. And hopefully the most important thing tonight is we want you to enjoy the presentation and learn something new about Alaska's wildlife. <clears throat> so real quick before I get in, um, for those of you who are not familiar with Alaska Wildlife Alliance, we're a grassroots nonprofit organization. We were founded by Alaskans in 1978 to protect Alaska's wildlife for its intrinsic value, as well as for the benefit of present and future generations of Alaskans. We advocate for healthy ecosystems, which are scientifically and ethically managed to protect our wildlife, especially in this increasingly dynamic world where we're seeing a lot of change. Um, just kind of briefly, some of the programs that we do, we have a citizen science program. And so we are a partner with the Alaska Beluga Monitoring Partnership. And that is a group of organizations that come together to help train citizen scientists in the Cook Inlet region to help monitor for the critically endangered Cook and Beluga whales. And our monitoring season has actually just started and Alaska Wildlife Alliance, along with Kenai Peninsula College, we co-host the monitoring sites at Kenai River and Kasilaf River. And we are excited to say we have already started receiving sightings of beluga whales in those locations. We also, another citizen science project that we work with is we partner with COAST. And that stands for Coastal Observation and Seabird Survey Team. And so COAST is um, an organization that is trying to gather information on the seabird die-offs around the state of Alaska. And so we use citizen scientists to help track those and do beach walks. And so we just helped COAST have a, um, a training session just earlier, a um, couple days ago. Um, so if you want more information about COAST or the Alaska Beluga Monitoring Partnership, you can go to our website at akwildlife.org. Another one of our programs is our education and outreach program. Um, obviously our Wildlife Wednesdays fall under that type of program where we're trying to get folks to come together and talk about Alaska's wildlife. Um, but we also do other types of activities. So one example is we've partnered with other organizations to develop several whiteboard videos. Um, and so um, one of those is talking about the board of game process uh, board of Fish process and the Federal Subsistence Board processes. So those are on our YouTube channel. Uh, we also have Species Spotlights, we have Trivia Tuesdays, so just a lot of different ways that we try to educate uh, Alaskans and others who are interested in Alaska's wildlife about our unique and fantastic wildlife here. And then we also are very active in the advocacy branch. Uh, one of the products that we've just recently put out is a report um, that we called Map the Trap. That is a survey that we have um, opened up to folks when they are recreating, if they see traps near recreational trails, they can report those through our website. And this was very important because we are learning that, first of all, there's no organization, no government entity that is actually trapping, tracking 
uh, encounters with traps that involve humans, um, dogs on trails, or even non-targeted wildlife species. So unfortunately, some species such as birds or moose have been caught and killed in traps. And so um, recognizing an absence of a place for people to report that, we started Map the Trap. And so uh, we have information from the 2020 to 2021 season um, where people come report their encounters and we've put that in report and we've shared that with various government agencies, the Board of Game, um, anyone who might be interested. So if you are a recreator and you're on a trail and you see a trap and you don't know who to report it to, you can go to our website and put it and we will include that in our next report. Uh, we also have advocacy for various other things. We are active in lawsuits, um, filling up public comments. Uh, we've recently completed uh, co-hosting a climate adaptation workshop where we brought together several government entities, um, tribal organizations, nonprofit organizations to talk about um, different strategies for climate adaptation in the state of Alaska since we are actually experiencing climate change right now. So those are just a really quick snapshot of some of the activities that AWA is involved with and what we do. Um, if you go on our website, you will be able to see a little, a little more snippets about individual things. So here's just some examples of the types of things that have been in the news where AWA has been in the news lately. So I'm not gonna go into that. You can visit our website, akwildlife.org to learn more. I do wanna spend a little bit of time to talk about some of our upcoming events. Our Wildlife Wednesday program is still going on every Wednesday for the first, second, and third weeks of the month through April. Um, something that is new is I talked about one of our citizen science projects is the Alaska Beluga Monitoring Partnership. So that monitoring program has started. So if you are in the Cook Inlet area and you wanna learn how to become a citizen scientist, there is a volunteer orientation and training coming up on March 30th from 6 to 7.30 p.m. It is a virtual training. And so you can go to our website to learn more about that, or you can go to akbmp.org. That stands for Alaska Beluga Monitoring Partnership. Um, also as part of that, during these monitoring seasons, AWA sends out alerts via text message when we learn that belugas are spotted in the Kenai or Kasilaf rivers. So if you're in those areas and you wanna receive an alert, you can just text the word beluga to 833-541-0408 to get signed up for those notifications. And I will put that in the chat feature in here just a little bit. And then something else that's coming up really soon that we're excited about is we're partnering with several other organizations and we're gonna be hosting a Kachemak Bay Marine Mammal Forum. That will be in Homer uh, the week of April 18th. So it'll be uh, kind of later in the afternoon and evenings for two hours, Monday through Thursday. Um, and so stay tuned to our website for more information about that. We're still in the planning stage of finalizing the agenda, but we are really excited that that's coming up soon. And hope uh, for those in the Homer area or nearby, hope to see you there. And then just real quick, because we are a nonprofit, we get pretty much everything through donations of one form or another. So if you're interested in the work that AWA does or you like these Wildlife Wednesdays and wanna to continue to support them, we urge you to become a member. Memberships start at just $35 a year. Um, we also accept corporate sponsorships. And I know in the past, you guys, if you've been to one of our Wildlife Wednesdays, you know that we are a charity through Amazon Smile, through the Pick, Click, Give program with your PFD. Um, the combined federal campaign, that is for federal employees who want to make a donation through that CFC program. Um, through the Roundup app, um, we are a charity there. I, I also wanted to point out some of our more recent uh, partnerships. We are now a charity with Fred Myers. So if you put in your rewards number, they will give a donation to us when you make a purchase. Um, for those of you in the Anchorage area, we are actually the um, charity of the month for Blue Market, and they are a market that follows a zero waste model. And so uh, if you do any shopping at Blue Market for the rest of this month, they will make a donation to our organization. And then um, Fashion Pact, which is a uh, used clothing store in Anchorage. Uh, you can donate clothing and then they sell them and $2 of every purchase. Um, we'll come back to Alaska Wildlife Alliance. So if you're thinking about cleaning out your closet uh, and donating your clothing, maybe consider looking into Fashion Pack. 
So with that, um, I don't want to delay any longer, and I want to turn it over to our speaker tonight, is Kim Ramsirian. She is with the National Marine Fisheries Service, and she is a marine mammal scientist, and she is going to be talking about the program Lose the Loop. So let me stop sharing. Okay, Kim, take it away. Thank you, Mandy. Okay, can you see that okay? Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much, Mandy. Thanks for the invitation to talk to all of you this evening. Um, the title of my talk is Lose the Loop, Preventing Entanglement Risks for Stellar Sea Lions and All Marine Life. Before I get started, I'd like to um, do a land acknowledgement. I'm honored to acknowledge that I am presenting to you today from Juneau, Alaska, the ancestral land of the Tlingit. For more than 10,000 years, Alaskan Native people have been and continue to be integral to the well being of our community. I am grateful to be a part of this community and to honor the culture, tradition, and resilience of the Tlingit people. Gunishchish. So I'd like to take you on a little journey tonight to kind of start where we were about 20 or so years ago and where we've come um, to the present day. So um, I'm not going to talk to you tonight about marine debris because Veronica Padula gave a great Wildlife Wednesday talk last week. Um, so you could check out her talk to learn more. But it, um, as we see uh, marine mammals being entangled in marine debris and fishery interactions, and become injured and actually killed, we wanted to do something about this. So this is kind of the journey of what we've done so far. So tonight I'm going to talk to you a little bit about stellar sea lions and some of the entanglement response that we've done. I'm going to talk to you about our international pinniped entanglement group, deterrence, the NOAA Ocean Guardian School program, and some things we can all do to help. So first, stellar sea lions. But before I get started, I just want to give a huge thank you to everybody that's been a part of this work over the last 20 or so years, and in particular, Lori Jemison and Kate Savage, who um, I've worked alongside for many years. So um, thank you to everybody that has been a part of this work. So stellar sea lions. You'll wonder why maybe that there is a Fiat 500 silhouette here next to some sea lions. So adult male sea lions can get up to 2,400 pounds and females can get up to 800 pounds and then juveniles are anywhere from 140 to 500 pounds. So an adult male weighs about the same um, as a Fiat 500. So that kind of plays into our story of why in the past it's been really difficult to safely capture uh, entangled sea lions. So a little bit about stellar sea lions. Um, males are sexually mature between three and eight years of, old, of age, but they don't hold a territory, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, until they're a little bit older, between nine and 11. So they um, come ashore, usually around May, and they set up a territory, and they fight each other to hold these territories. And then the females come ashore um, and basically select the territory of the male that they would like to use. So females reproduce about the first time between four to six years of age. <clears throat> they usually remain with their pups up to about two weeks and then they start doing regular foraging trips um, offshore while the pup remains on shore. They mate um, 11 to 14 days after they give birth and they have delayed implantation. So the embryo does not implant for about three to four months. And then pups are born anywhere between May and July, and they wean anywhere from one to three years of age. And just because I'm gonna end up probably saying rookery and haul out, in case you're not familiar with those terms, the, a rookery is where the sea lions come ashore to give birth. That's where the males are defending those territories. So these red circles are showing adult males, all these other, uh, bigger animals are adult females and then the little black guys, if you can see those, those are the pups. 
Haul-outs are just basically resting areas. So sometimes you'll see a pup born on a haul-out, but these are used throughout the year and primarily just um, the animals come ashore to rest when they're not out foraging. So um, why are we studying sea lions? Well, sea lions declined um, by more than 80% in the late 70s to early 80s. And this, uh, this shows the sea lion range in purple here. So the population was listed as threatened in 1990. And then with um, further genetic studies, the population was split into an Eastern and a Western population. And when that was done, the Western population was um, listed as endangered. The Eastern population remained threatened. And then over the years, the Eastern population, um, so east of 144 degrees west longitude has actually done really well. They've been, um, the population has been increasing and they were delisted from the Endangered Species Act in 2013. However, the Central and Western Aleutians and Russia um, population of the sea lions is still declining. So because um, we've been interested in uh, looking at the stellar sea lions overall and comparing a lot of comparisons between Eastern and Western populations, we, um, before budgets got tighter and tighter, we used to go to all the haul-outs and rookeries throughout Southeast Alaska to um, conduct brand site surveys um, and conduct counts. And then while we were out there, we started seeing uh, entangled animals. So um, just a quick warning, there are some sad photos coming up. So I just wanted to let you know that, but we started collecting this data back in 2000. And over about the last 20 or so years, we've identified at least 855 individuals that are either entangled in marine debris or that have swallowed fishing gear. And this is just in Southeast Alaska and just during the summer, just a, like between a two to three week trip. So about half of these are neck entanglements. And sadly, uh, a lot of times we can't even um, identify what the material is because it's so deeply embedded in the neck like this poor animal. Um, but when we can identify the material, we found that over half of the entanglements in Alaska are these plastic packing bands. And I'm sure everybody is familiar with these. They're on basically every kind of shipping container now. TSA uses them. And um, they're a huge problem, not only for stellar sea lions, but also for uh, all marine mammals. There's a, and fish and birds. So um, they're, they're a real problem. About 30% of the entanglements we see are black rubber bands. A lot of times either, these are cut inner tube tires and they're usually used in uh, pot fisheries. You can find them sometimes on other things like this pair of snowshoes, but the majority are from the pot fishery. And then we see nets, rope, line, and other types of garbage that entangle sea lions. Probably everybody's familiar with this, but I just thought I'd show, um, because this is how sea lions get entangled and we've, we've watched them get entangled. They find something in the water. They're very curious animals, as I'm sure you've seen, and they start playing with it and they throw it up in the air and it lands around their neck. And once it's around their neck, they really can't back out of it. They can't use their flippers to get it off. And then as they grow, it starts getting tighter and tighter. And that's when it becomes a, a real problem. So with the fishery interactions, the majority of the fishery interactions in Southeast Alaska are with a salmon hook and line gear. And this could be commercial, charter, sport. Um, it's really difficult to tell, but we, we know that it's the salmon gear because you'll see this huge lure or flasher hanging from their mouth, which indicates they've swallowed a hook. And then sometimes we'll also see long line gear. You can see this circle hook in the lip of this juvenile. And um, both sexes and all age classes uh, interact with the fishery. And sometimes the sea lions are lucky enough to bite through the monofilament line and uh, lose this flasher, even though the hook is still in their body. Um, sometimes they can live with that. It, I, it'll either pass or um, the body will deal with it. So for example, this little guy, um, he was born in 2002. He, we photographed him with a flasher in July of 2006. Then he was photographed again a month later and he didn't have the flasher. Then we saw him every single summer from 2007 through 2014, no flasher. We saw him again in 
2015, he did it again, he hasn't learned his lesson, and then he lost it again in 2016. So he he was lucky. Yeah, he at least got two different times and survived that. Unfortunately, a lot of the animals are not surviving that. So um, this is another individual that was born in 1999. We saw him with a flasher in July of 2005, and he washed up dead um, a month later. And like I said, this is a, a problem for many different species um, throughout the world. So at least 693 marine species become entangled in or swallow marine debris. And this has increased by 50% since 1997. So it's something we really need to uh, put some focus into. And now sadly, we have all these dis disposable masks um, floating around out there. So we need to um, cut those loops as well, which I'll talk about in a moment. Okay, so as I said, we started collecting this data in 2000 and for 13 years, we had no safe way to capture these large animals. There wasn't a drug um, that was safe for them if they went into the water where they wouldn't drown. But finally, some veterinarians came up with a um, drug combination and now we can actually respond to some of these animals. So our entanglement response, our objectives are to dart specific entangled animals, capture and remove the entangling or ingested material, and then attach flipper tags and satellite tags so that we can monitor their post-release survival. So how do we do that? Well, the first thing we do is estimate the weight of the animal um, because we need to know how much of the drug to give the animal to sedate it. And then um, our amazing veterinarian, Kate Savage, is just really good. She can get really close stalking up to the animal because if she uses the least amount of pressure, a lot of times um, the sea lion will stay on shore, which is ideal for us to be able to respond to, to him. And it's very individual. Sometimes they'll fall asleep within about five minutes. Sometimes it's 25 minutes. So um, our Kate, our veterinarian, monitors uh, the sea lion. She gives him oxygen, monitors his respiration and temperature. And then the rest of us get to work on the rest of the, the things that we're doing. So the first thing we do, of course, is remove the entanglement. You can see this plastic packing band. Look at the, you know, what it's done to this animal as, as, as he has grown. The flashers, all we can do is just cut the flasher off so that, um, the hook will remain in their body, but like I said, they can survive that. And we just, we have no other way to really, um, we can't do surgery out there on, in the field. Then we um, we put a, apply a temporary die mark and a flipper tag on one flipper. Sometimes we'll glue these uh, satellite um, tags to the fur of the head. These are really, they give us really detailed information about dive, the dive depth and dive duration and location. But then in the last couple of years, we've started using these um, flipper tags. They're location only, so they don't give us dive information, but they give us information about whether or not the animal is still alive and where he is. So that, and they will last like up, up to a couple of years, whereas these um, head mount that are glued to the fur, um, they will fall off when the, the sea lion molts and they molt in August and September. So it doesn't give us a lot of time to get information. Um, once we done that, we collect samples, photos, measurements. Uh, Kate will give reversal drugs to wake, to wake the sea lion up and then we release them. And so here's an example of this guy who had a flasher. Um, that's the before and here's the after. So pretty colorful, but it's it's really good for us to be able to identify easily um, the sea lion once he's up with all the rest of the sea lions um, from the boat. If the sea lion jumps into the water, it's a lot more challenging. We can still do it, um, but it's basically all hands on deck. Everybody's watching the water to make sure that we can follow the sea lion um, as because, you know, right after he jumps in, he's swimming pretty fast until he starts slowing down and going to sleep. So once he's kind of getting sleepy and slowing down, we use this um, capture pole to bring him alongside our boat. We can still put a flipper tag. We can take the entanglement off, still get some samples. 
In this case, we use a paint stick to just to put some color on his head so it's easy to see him because the um, hair dye doesn't work when he's underwater like that. These are just some examples of what happens with packing bands. They don't really break, they just sort of fray until they're thinner and thinner. And as the animal grows, it really causes problems. This is a, um, like a steel belt that we re remove from a sea lion. And then here's a flasher. So um, we have disentangled only 10 animals to date. Um, we removed four neck entanglements and six flashers. Uh, we put out six head mount satellite tags and four flipper mount satellite tags. So again, we, um, our big goal is prevention because we really can't reach very many animals um, that are entangled. It's very expensive. It requires a real experienced crew. So um, we want to keep this from happening in the first place. This just shows you from the, those satellite tags. This is just um, each of these colors is a different individual. It just shows you their movements that we can get from, from the tags. And you can see this guy, we had removed uh, a flasher from, from him at Graves Rocks here. And he just went way up here to Kayak Island and started feeding. So he probably was pretty hungry. And then I just wanted to put this in here because um, some of you may have heard about this uh, sea lion in Sitka a few years ago. And I just thought if you had heard about him, you might want to have known what happened. And so this sea lion was observed on the road by somebody in their truck um, one evening. We don't know why he was up on the road, but the person in the truck kind of followed him and the sea lion got scared and was running down the road and ended up going into the woods. And the community spent about four days trying to get him into the water, all kinds of different methods, and he just wouldn't go. Um, people were talking about, you know, shooting him and um, putting him to sleep and, you know, thinking he was sick and everything. And um, anyway, Kate and I were able to fly over to Sitka and he looked pretty healthy to us. We just thought he was scared. So, uh, Kate was able to dart him in the woods and we had to use a front end loader to roll him into because he was so huge. And then we put him on the back of a flat bed, bed truck, took him over to the harbor, um, released him on the, on the ramp there. We put a satellite tag on and some, a die mark and let him go. And this is what he did. So he left um, sick and went all the way up to Kayak Island that, like that other sea lion did, then all the way over here to Kodiak and then up to Homer. So that transmitter lasted for three months. And so I don't think he was sick. And um, yeah, he probably didn't want to have anything to do with Sitka anymore. But he, uh, yeah, it was great information to get using that satellite tag. Okay, so let's talk about some solutions to these problems. Like I said, our big goal is prevention. Um, we really need to prevent all of this garbage and debris from entering our waterways. So one way we did this is we formed a pinniped entanglement group and pinniped is a seal or sea lion. So we are a global community dedicated to the safety and welfare of pinnipeds. And our mission is to reduce pinniped entanglements in marine debris and fishing gear through education, outreach, and rescue. We started um, in 2009, which is four of us, and we now have more than 146 members in 18 countries. And each one of these little block, these little blue dots indicates um, a group that's part of our pinniped entanglement group. Our objectives are to increase awareness about the plight of entangled pinnipeds, educate others about the effects of marine trash on pinnipeds, work toward finding solutions to reduce trash in the ocean, and strive to uh, improve and expand upon entanglement response techniques and safely rescue, disentangle, and release pinnipeds entangled in marine debris and fishing gear. So we um, put a couple of newsletters out each year, just kind of highlighting all the great work that everybody's doing. We have conference calls, we share our tools and techniques, we share resources. Um, just last week, we finally launched our brand new PEG website, which is really exciting as it's something we've been um, kind of a dream of ours for years and it finally happened. So that's 
that's available now. And then we have workshops. And um, since I work for NOAA, we also do a lot of outreach and education. And we just made this new 30 second um, animated PSA called Lose the Loop. And Lose the Loop, by the way, is our slogan for our Pinniped Entanglement Group, which is to please cut a loop before you discard it in the trash. We also have brochures and signs and radio PSAs. So we, we do our best to try to get um, this information out. If you are interested in learning more about um, PEG, as we like to call it, um, please check out our new website. Um, or if you're interested in joining, you can uh, contact me as well. OK, now what about uh, all the interactions with fisheries? What have we been trying to do about that? Well, a few years ago, we had a uh, workshop with salmon hook and line fishermen uh, in Sitka. And our, our goal really was to um, try to work together on finding ways to pre prevent these interactions because it's no good for the sea lions because they're getting injured and they're dying. It's no good for the fishermen because they're losing their catch, they're losing their gear. They have to often you know, pull everything up and move to a new location. So it's a lose-lose for everybody and we wanted to try to do something about that. So um, we developed, we, all came together and one of the fishermen um, named our working group the sea lion avoidance working group or slog so that's our group and um, from there uh, Lori Jemison at fishing game wrote a um, NOAA bycatch reduction engineering program grant you can see all the collaborators here so we're collaborating with a lot of different um, fishermen and engineers and scientists in Scotland and we're testing the targeted acoustic startle device. Um, this is something that's being used pretty successfully in, um, in the United Kingdom. So it has low noise. Uh, it's targeted, the, the sound is targeted specifically to the hearing range of the animal that you're trying to deter. It's an autonomous acoustic startle reflex. So it kind of, um, it's not like some of the acoustic start or the acoustic devices that have been used in the past on seals and sea lions that the animals end up becoming habituated to. So this has less, it's less likely to become habituated. Um, basically it's a battery. This is the pod, which is the, um, the brains of the unit. And then the speaker that you put in the water. So our goal with this device is to deter sea lions away from salmon hook and line fisheries using this um, startle reflex and it's emitting these noise pulses specific in the sign hearing range. So one of the most important things is it cannot um, impact the fish because <laughs> we don't want to scare the fish away. Um, it's not in the hearing range of salmon, but we wanted to absolutely test this and make sure that it wasn't. And um, we did that here in Juneau. And so you can just see this is set up on the dock here. And here's a salmon, but basically the salmon swam right next to it, didn't even seem to phase them. So that was great. Uh, it worked. And then we field tested it this past summer um, at the Indian Islands in Southeast Alaska. And our results so far are pretty variable. Um, we had a lot of challenges because the equipment got stuck in customs. Um, the scientists from Scotland couldn't come over because of COVID. So we kind of had a, a lot of video calls with him trying to figure out how to set it all up and make it work. Um, and then we, you know, we lost some time waiting for customs to get out to the field. And then uh, there was a lot of current. So you can see our speaker here is kind of flying through the water. So we weighed it down. But um, anyway, some of the animals seem to be uh, startled. Others were not. So we're going to uh, continue our trials on some, uh, near some sea lion haulouts here near in Juneau this spring, and hopefully do some more modification. And if it looks promising, we'll be testing it on fishing vessels and um, testing it during the salmon fishing season and see how it does. So stay tuned for that. Another thing we're doing is we're um, having some regional and national virtual deterrence workshops this spring. Um, our focus is to foster um, creative and innovative collaboration among fishermen, biologists, and stakeholders. 
So we're kind of patterning it after that successful um, workshop we had with the salmon fishermen. And we're hoping to kind of do the same thing, listen and learn from fishermen. I mean, they're out there all the time. They're the experts. So um, we need to work together to find effective deterrence. So we're, we're hoping that um, we can start doing, doing this with other fisheries as well. So that will be coming up this in the next couple of months. Okay, on to the Ocean Guardian School program. So this is super exciting. We have this in Alaska now. So um, I learned about this program in uh, a few years ago by watching this amazing film, which I highly recommend called Plastic is Forever. So I just think it's really cool that I learned about Ocean Guardian School program from a then 12 year old boy. He um, had this program in his, his film and um, I was really excited about it and I wanted to bring it to Alaska. And so I wanna say a huge thank you to my boss, John Curlin, because really the Ocean Guardian School program has nothing to do with my job. Um, but he said yes, so that we could pilot it in Juneau with two schools. And um, with I, you can see all these amazing people. So Elyria is my supervisor, Ali Schuler and Jamie Musbach are both Alaska Sea Grant Fellows and Keelali Gibson um, works in our Anchorage office. So everybody over the past couple of years kind of joined in and helped with this effort. And so Thunder Mountain and Said Gastineau are our very first um, Ocean Guardian schools in Alaska. And they've been with us since the very beginning. And we have four other schools, Floyd Dryden Middle School, Montessori Borealis, in Juneau and Diamond High School in uh, Anchorage and St. Paul School in the Privilofs that are part of the program this year. So what is the Ocean Guardian School program? It was started in the 2009-2010 school year in California. It's managed by NOAA's Office of Marine Sanctuaries and basically it's a commitment to the protection and conservation of local watersheds, the world's oceans, and special ocean areas like National Marine Sanctuaries. So it's an opportunity for students, teachers, and the community to participate in a range of environmental and sustainable activities, learning programs, and opportunities that reflect environment and environmentally sustainable practices, and opportunities for classrooms to promote best environmental practices within the school and local community. So the students take on one um, of five different stewardship projects. They can select from marine debris projects. So this is kind of focusing on reducing um, and properly disposing of waste and with a focus on reducing single use plastics. The six R's, which are to rethink, refuse, reduce, reuse, recycle, and rot. So um, this involves a lot of, you know, just overall reduction of the amount of waste and also composting. Watershed restoration, so planting native plants and removing invasive species, school habitats and gardens, so um, having healthy gardens that are healthy for our watersheds, and then reducing our overall carbon footprint. So I think one of the really great things about this program is it's, you know, students across the nation are participating. So it's it's really a big community of students that are making a positive difference for the world. And I, I think that's really empowering for, for kids. So like I mentioned, we have four schools in Juneau that are currently in the program. And um, as you can see, they're all in one way or another reduce, working on reducing uh, single use plastics, also composting. And Diamond High School and St. Paul are also trying to reduce overall trash and pollution and marine debris. So what does it take to be an Ocean Garden School? Uh, it starts off with an um, introduction to the, to the rest of the school. This could be a school assembly or a video or something. Um, this is at Saeed Gastineau and Thunder Mountain when we first started. Um, we were all involved. We got costumes and trying to get the kids psyched about the program. One of the biggest parts of the program is measurable data because then the kids can can see where they started and where they're you know how much progress they've made during the school year. So um, a big part of that are, are doing waste audits where you dump all the you save a little bit of garbage from a couple of days and then dump it out on tarps, and the kids see what is being thrown away. 
And the thing that really got them at, at the beginning here was the amount of food that was wasted. I think it really had a huge impact on the kids. So the first year that they just have to do some type of internal outreach in their school, it could just be posters in the halls or you know, a newsletter to the, to the families. And then in a uh, year two and beyond, um, it's external outreach. So here are um, students from say Gaston on the radio. Here's a community cleanup event. Thunder Mountain High School students sold marine debris bracelets. And then at the end of the year, the students put their own presentation on. So they, they did all themselves. And this is again, the, the students are wearing our costumes, which look, look a lot better on them, I think. Um, they are they made up their own song and they sang to the rest of the student body about what they had done with the ocean guardian school program so a huge congratulations to thunder mountain high school they've reduced single-use plastic water bottles they've switched from plastic to silverware they've started the school-wide recycling program and Saeed Gastineau switched from plastic forks to silverware at the very beginning. Um, just within the first three months, they had already estimated that they kept more than 30,000 sporks from entering the landfill. And just this um, this year, just alone, so even with COVID, they're they're just they're just rock stars. Um, they've already composted over 2,000 pounds of food waste. And um, their teacher Monica Haga told me last week that. Um, their third grade students took it upon themselves. They started their own initiative of a, a playground cleanup. They ask for one glove each so they don't waste two gloves and they have a sign up sheet and they go out on their own and clean up the playground. So it's really, it's just so amazing. The kids are really inspiring. And then this is something that Kilali Gibson and um, others uh, in Alaska, Hawaii, American Samoa, and Guam have started this new collaboration called the Pacific Exchange Network. And this is a mission to bring together students across the Pacific fo focused on highlighting indigenous and local native sharing of information. So um, one of these groups um, gives a presentation to the rest of the, the schools every month and um, they're, they're having a video co um, competition. So that's, that's new this year, which is really great. And on the Ocean Guardian school website, um, they make an infographic that kind of gives all the, the highlights of, of all the great work that the students have done and the impact of, of the work they've done. So like I said, it's, it's supposed to be simple. It just needs a champion in each school, and that can be a teacher, or it can be a parent or a community member. It has to have a watershed connection, uh, internal and external outreach, measurable data. They, uh, the, the teacher does a final report survey and then they become an Ocean Guardian school and they get to display um, the, these banners in their school um, to show that they are an Ocean Guardian school. So um, the schools are really proud of these as they should be because they're doing great work. So applications for this coming uh, next school year are open April 1st and uh, they're they're, it's open until June 1st, so they're due then. Uh, there's a lot of outreach materials and videos and feedback and guidance. Um, you get the banner and I'm your Alaska um, regional coordinator, so you can reach out to me or the director, or, um, or if you have questions, please reach out and I'm, I'd be happy to talk to you about that. I also wanted to say we had no funding um, for this in Alaska when we started because we're not in our marine sanctuary. So a huge thank you to the Southeast Alaska Fish Habitat Partnership because um, they provided some seed money to our schools so they could get started. Also the um, Audubon Society chapter in Juneau and then the kids also raised their own money um, by picking up garbage around town through um, the Litter Free um, organization here. And then we did get a NOAA grant just this past year. So we do have some funding for the schools now, which is really great. Okay, so what can the rest of us do? Well, lose the loop. This is a simple thing that everybody can do. It doesn't cost you a thing. Please cut any loop before you discard it properly in the trash. And it can be even a little tab from the milk carton, uh, anything um, that could get out into the environment and entangle an animal. So please cut the, cut the straps on your um, masks before you throw them away or just any loop. 
stash the trash and you will save lives. Really important is that we have to turn off the tap of all this garbage. Um, we can keep cleaning up and we need to keep cleaning up the beaches, but we, we need to stop the stream. So um, contact your manufacturers and say, hey, you know, stop using so many plastic packing bands or change your practices. And I don't know if those of you that shop at Costco, they've switched from those plastic clam shells that they had all the apples in. They're now in um, cardboard boxes. So they've, they've made a switch. So that's awesome and encouraging. We can all practice the six R's like we mentioned earlier. Choose to reuse, try to reduce your overall use of single use plastics and um, use reusable items. Get involved, participate in coastal cleanups or when you're out, just pick up garbage. So you can do my marine debris exercise plan, which is to pick 10 or more each, have a clean beach. You find trash, you bend over and pick it up, you put it in the bag and you repeat. So you can uh, get exercise while you're out there. Also um, related to all of this is not feeding sea lions because it does lead to um, problems with, between humans and sea lions. So please take the lead, do not feed. Feeding marine mammals is illegal. It can cause habituation and aggression. It also has negative impacts to fisheries. So it can change the natural behavior of sea lions. It can decrease their willingness to find their own food and increase their chances that they're going to steal food from um, steal fish from gear. And we can all kind of do our part by educating others, encouraging a no feeding policy in our communities, keeping a clean dock and boat so not leaving fish or discarded fish pieces where sea lions can reach them. And um, we made an animated PSA um, about this as well. You can find that on our website. And then uh, if you do see entangled sea lions or any injured or dead marine mammals, uh, we have a 24 hour stranding hotline in Alaska that, that has a real person you can talk to. So you can, um, you can uh, report any of this. If you see entangled sea lions, it's really important to get the date, the location, the type of entanglement and take as many photos as you can from different angles, um, but please stay at least 100 meters away. And then um, you can call that stranding hotline to report that. Okay, so we started our journey with this um, and wondered what we could do. And now we have an international pinniped entanglement group. We have an ability to disentangle stellar sea lions that we did not have um, when we started. We're testing deterrence that hopefully will make a positive difference for everyone. We have this amazing Ocean Guardian School Program in Alaska and really inspirational students. And a lot of people are working together. So thank you for that. And I'm going to leave you with somebody who is a huge inspiration to me. This is Afra Shah. And I met him at a marine debris conference several years ago. He, uh, in October of 2015, he and his 84-year-old neighbor started cleaning Versova Beach. Here's the before picture here in the bottom left. And pretty soon, more and more people started helping. They have now cleaned up more than 60 million pounds of garbage. Here's the after picture. And turtles returned to nest on this beach for the first time in 20 years. So not only did he started this huge movement and this is a beautiful beach for everybody to enjoy but now it's safer for the wildlife too so yeah it can take one person so i just want to leave you with with that because he is a huge inspiration thank you so much for your time and attention uh, i really appreciate you hanging in there this evening and i'd be happy to answer questions thank you Thanks, Kim. Um, I'm just going to say, I think you win the prize for covering the most programs. Um, and it was really amazing to hear all the different things that are being worked on right now. Yes. Can you hear me? Hello. Yes. Not very well. No, you're really broken up. Okay, hold on, let me change my headset here. I can hear you a little bit better now. Okay, how's that? 
I was just saying that um, I think you win the award for covering the most um, different programs on a single topic. And it was really amazing. <laughs> um, Thank you. So that was, that was really fantastic. Thanks so much for that program. And so I just wanna remind everybody that um, go ahead and if you have questions about any of these programs that Kim talked about tonight, go ahead and put those in the chat and um, give folks a few minutes. And Kim, I just wanted to say, I'm very, very impressed by um, how the Pinniped Entanglement Group, it started with just four of you here in Alaska and it has grown to this you know, international program. I mean, talk about Alaska pride, first of all, way to go. Um, but it reminds me of a quote from Margaret Mead. And it says, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever does. And it sounds like your Pinniped Entanglement Group, I mean, that's exactly what she's talking about. It was just four of you and now it's so much attention and so much, um, um, buy-in and so many other people are part of this that it's just really amazing. So congratulations on that. Um, and Thank while you. folks are typing um, their questions, I just want to take this time just to say the thank yous. So I want everyone to say, you know, um, a virtual clap for Kim. She volunteered her time to do this. Um, we're not paying her anything. Um, so we're super grateful for her for, for doing that for us um, and educating us on this topic. And um, something that's, uh, it was some very sad and heartbreaking photos in there, but it's really exciting to know that there are some committed individuals that are working to try to not only save the animals, but promoting prevention so that you won't have to save them in the future. Um, and then I wanna just thank all of the members for Alaska Wildlife Alliance, your donations and membership is how we are able to put on these programs. So thank you for that. Um, and then, so let's go to the chat and let's see. Um, so Bev had a question, has a sea lion ever gone back in the water after being darted? If so, what happens to the sea lion then? So I know you touched on that if you darted one in the water, but what about in this type of case? Yeah, so I probably wasn't clear. We, we never dart them in the water because um, darting, you know, into the water, it can go anywhere. So we always dart them on land and they, and they do go in the water. So uh, we usually have at least two boats, sometimes three boats. So it's really, um, we, we really have to watch and monitor. So we only will do this work if um, we have good weather conditions and good visibility so that we can, we can track the, the sea lion. Um, there is remote sedation done elsewhere, like down on California sea lions down along the West Coast. They use transmitter darts because they're in such busy harbors. We don't do that um, because they have a little barb and we'd rather not do that if we don't have to. Um, but that is another option that you can, then you can track them with the transmitter, you know, if you think they were, they would get lost like in a harbor, but, but but since there's usually no one, no one around when we're doing our work, we, yeah. Great, thank you. And then uh, Bev had another question. She asked if you do any work on the Western population of sea lions. Yeah, so um, when I used to work for Alaska Fishing Game, and so yes, I used we used to work throughout Alaska. Um, I'm now the Western um, Stellar Sea Lion um, Recovery Coordinator, so. I'm kind of working with all the different uh, stellar sea lion biologists in Alaska on the Western and Eastern population, but with a focus on the Western because we're trying to figure out how we can best recover that population. Yeah, okay, let's see. It looks like we've got some more thank yous um, in here. So Laura B says, this is very sad and disturbing. Thanks for trying to help. Beth awesome. says, thank you for sharing this program and info. Much appreciated and good to know for when we are in the Southeast area. Um, also, thank you for a wonderful presentation and some really hopeful solutions. Yes, it's really great that there are things that the everyday person can be working on to try to help reduce the situation. Yeah. And then um, Karen said that she missed the first um, half of the presentation um, she's looking forward to watching it. Um, 
So when we post it on our website. So yes, that. thank you for that plug, Karen. Yes, we do post all of our Wildlife Wednesdays on the website. So I uh, hope to have this up uh, by Friday. Um, and I think it'll also be on our, our YouTube channel as well. So our website is akwildlife.org. So if you miss any of the Wildlife Wednesdays or want to come back and watch Kim's again, because there was just so much information in here about all the different <laughs> programs that she's working on, um, give us just a couple days and we'll have it up on the website. Um, so we still have some time for questions. Feel free to type them in the chat. And so Kim, I had a couple of questions. Um, okay. I was just wondering, are you seeing the materials that sea lions are getting entangled in, in Alaska? Is that different than what pinnipeds and other areas are being entangled in? It is a little bit different. You know, we, so we, we see on stellar sea lions, it's primarily packing bands. On fur seals, northern fur seals, um, I, it's more trawl netting. Um, in other areas, it's a lot of it's a lot of gill net and monofilament. Like um, in the United Kingdom, that's there they have a lot of issues with with gill nets. Uh, on the East Coast, it's more gill nets. Um, in Namibia, um, which I'd encourage everybody to check out the Ocean Conservation Group in Namibia. They are, there are a couple, a few kayak guides that just started um, a disentanglement program and they've disentangled hundreds and hundreds of, of fur seals. They're just mm -hmm. super inspirational. They're part of our pinniped entanglement group. They, they see a lot of, um, yeah, a lot of trawl netting and fishing gear. So I, I'd say overall, like fishing gear seems to be the, you know, different types of fishing gear that's either lost or abandoned. Um, that's a big problem. And then we're seeing more and more packing bands kind of around the world. And then weird things like, you know, clothing and plastic bags that kind of knot up. So um, it, it, it is variable in different parts of the world. And are you seeing much more of, you mentioned, um, you know, all the masks now and, you know, urging people to cut the loops in their mask. Are you seeing, or, or people in the pin and pet entanglement group around the world seeing more entanglements in masks? They've seen entanglements in, in young animals in masks and then, you know, a lot of birds, a lot of seabirds and other, you know, other birds are getting entangled in masks. So it's, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, just all, if we can all just kind of keep cleaning up and cutting loops that I, that'll make a different, a, a real huge difference. Yeah. And those are super simple things to do. Just anything that yeah. forms a circle, cut it before we throw yeah, it away. Exactly. So that's, I, I love all the slogans. They're super easy to remember. Um, I think we should give you an award for that as well. Um, the most super easy to remember slogans, lose the loop but, um, is great. Um, let's see. So some other questions. Um, you gave an example at Costco for the apples. Um, are you yeah. seeing any other companies that are changing their practices in regards to plastics? Um, we are, you know, I mean, I, I think we're seeing overall that this is getting to be a, a bigger problem a around the world. So we're seeing a lot more companies trying to make things out of alternative products. So we're, we're starting to see people trying to figure out how they can use kelp um, to make things um, out of bioplastics, mm. which are from kelp, which is really cool and exciting. Um, there was a, a group that was trying to, or that has a, a paper kind of packing band, um, but it just, it's not holding up in water. So I'm still kind of holding out hope that somebody, you know, there's a lot of smart people on, in this world. So somebody's going to come up with something really great to replace plastic packing bands. Something to definitely keep our fingers crossed for. Oh, yeah. Um, okay. Oh, I'm not seeing any more questions in the chat. Um, so I did put in the chat for folks, if you're curious, um, Kim mentioned the new Pinniped Entanglement Group website. So I put that in the chat, pinnipedentanglementgroup.org. And so it sounds like that's something worth um, checking out. And then that's, you know, um, is that group in Namibia's website on there? Yeah, so all the different groups, um, if you go to them, there's a page about us and it's got all the different groups and there are links to everybody's website. So you can go check out all the different groups that are a part of PEG. So it's kind of, yeah, there's a lot of amazing people. So it's really neat. Fantastic. And then I also put in the chat, I tried to capture the uh, stranding hotline. 
So that was Thank the 877-925-7773 number. And so that number is good, not only for reporting entanglements, but if people see any um, stranded or marine mammals in distress, um, that's a good phone number for them to call too. Yep. Great. Um, Thank you. Okay. Well, uh, if you guys have any questions, um, you know, Kim said you could contact her. Uh, she had her email in the presentation. So that will be up on our website. Um, give us a couple of days to get that updated. And um, again, Kim, thank you so much. We really appreciate you taking the time. Uh, we appreciate everybody who joined the call. I know here in the Anchorage area, it is a beautiful day. Um, so uh, <laughs> really appreciate folks uh, staying indoors to learn about this. Um, but um, again, so just thank you and um, appreciate everybody. And we will see you um, one, two, three, in April for our next Wildlife Wednesday. So stay tuned and thanks everybody. Appreciate it, Kim. Thank you. Thanks, Mindy. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.